Welcome everyone to yet another Space at Google talk. Today we have the privilege of hosting Dr. Michael Meyer, NASA scientist, head of Mars science at NASA. Let me read a little bit from his biography because it's interesting and it shows you the path on how to become a head of Mars <laughs> science. <laughs> So Michael Meyer is a senior scientist at NASA headquarters in the Science Mission Directorate. He's the lead scientist for NASA's Mars Explore Exploration Program, responsible for the science content of current and future Mars missions, and program scientist for the Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity Mission. During this period, Dr. Meyer has also served as the science liaison for the Review of Human Space Spaceflight Plans Committee, and uh, he was also awarded a Presidential Rank Award for Meritorious Professional Service. Mara was the Senior Scientist for Astrobiology and Program Scientist for the Mars Odyssey mission that was launched in 2001 and is still orbiting Mars. The Astrobiology program started in 1997 with Dr. Meyer as the Discipline Scientist. So he actually made his own discipline. And the discipline is dedicated to the study of the life in universe. Since 1993, Dr. Meyer managed NASA, NASA's exobiology program. And from 94 to 97, Dr. Meyer was also the planetary protection officer for NASA, responsible for mission compliance to NASA's policy concerning forward and back contamination during plan planetary exploration. Dr. Meyer was the program scientist for the Mars Microprobe Mission, DS2, and for two Phase I shuttle Mir experiments. Meyer was detailed from the Desert Research Institute. So this was at the University of Nevada, where he was an assistant research professor from 1989 to 1997. From 1985, to 1989, he served as associate director and associate in research for the Polar Desert Research Station, Department of Biological Science, Florida State University. In 1998, he was a visiting research scientist at the Culture Cent Center for Algae and Protozoa in Cambridge, England. Dr. Meyer's primary research interest is in microorganisms living in extreme conditions, particularly the physical factors controlling microbial growth and survival. He has conducted field research in the Gobi Desert, the Negev Desert, Siberia, and the Canadian Arctic. He is also a veteran of six research expeditions to Antarctica to study microbial ecosystems in the McMurdo Dry Valleys and investigates krill phytoplankton relations and research primary productivity in the Weddell Sea. His experience also includes two summers working as a treasure salvager of the coast of Florida and North Carolina. So when it comes to little things that live in difficult places, I think uh, Dr. Meyer here is the expert for the field. So please welcome Dr. Michael Meyer. Uh, it's my pleasure to come here. And obviously, uh, when I was growing up, I didn't have as my ultimate goal to be the lead scientist of the Mars program. It just happened that way. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of overview of the Mars program and then also then really dig into what the mission Curiosity is doing, how we got there, and uh, its capabilities on the surface of Mars. So uh, first off, you know, if we do a comparison, this, uh, these are stretched, um, <laughs> but essentially they're, uh, they're approximately um, the right size in reference to each other. So uh, the thing that you want to note is Mars is about half the size and diameter of Earth. And it is impressive how big the moon is compared to our uh, planetary brethren. 
What I want to do is point out there's a couple of you know major differences. You know, half the diameter, it has about one third the gravity, it has about actually more than one or less than one one hundredth the atmosphere. Mars has one one hundredth the atmosphere that Earth has. Uh, Mars has a slightly elliptical orbit, so its seasons are not symmetric. Um, its atmosphere is uh, over 95% carbon dioxide. The atmosphere of Earth is you know, mostly uh, nitrogen and a fair amount of oxygen. So there are major differences, but there are some similarities. You know, one is they were formed at the same time 4.567 billion years ago. Um, there are terrestrial planets. Um, Mars early on, apparently, you know, this is what we're really investigating, was warmer and wetter, may have had water on the surface. At the same time that life started on Earth, Mars was more like Earth. And because of that, we see it as a potential for having had life. Almost more importantly, Mars today does not seem to have plate tectonics. We look at its surface and over half of it is ancient. There's ancient rocks on the surface. This is not the case with our planet. Our planet has plate tectonics, has biology, it has erosion. We have a relatively new surface to look at. But because of that, the record of what happened on this planet to get life started and early evolution is almost completely erased. We only have a few examples. We don't have the record here. But Mars will have the record of what was going on in the first billion years of history in our solar system at a time that life started in our solar system. So by going there, we can explore what would have been happening in the solar system when life got started. We might even have evidence of life starting on that planet and maybe even its evolution. So because of that, Mars holds a really great potential to not, inform us, not only inform us about planetary processes, early evolution, that sort of thing, but also inform us about how we got started. So for that, I think it's a good reason to explore Mars. So we've had a program, and it's been very successful, and it's culminated in, in Curiosity landing on the surface, August 6, Universal Time. We have a MAVEN plan to launch in 2013. And what I like to, you know, the big news two days ago was, in fact, we have a program that takes us in the future. <coughs> hmm. Um, there we go. <laughs> it's, oh my God, <laughs> we lost it. So uh, what I want to point out here is that in yellow we have collaboration with the Europeans. So we've been doing that all along. And so after 2013, we weren't sure what we were going to be able to do as an agency in terms of Mars exploration. But as it turns out, we're contributing uh, communications with ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. Uh, we've selected a discovery mission that is going to go to the surface and uh, do seismometry and heat flow measurements of the surface, our, our first geophysical mission really to the Red Planet. Uh, ESA is sending a <coughs> rover with life detection capabilities in 2018, and, and we're building a major portion of the organic analyzer to be incorporated in that. And what was announced on Tuesday is, in fact, we are planning to send another rover based on the MSL architecture to explore Mars. So we have a future. We have things to do. Having a program is great. We learn lots of things. You know, some of the things that have happened in the last decade and a half is that we've been able to map out the planet extremely accuracy in terms of altitude. We've been um, being able to measure the impact rates. It also tells us where ice is in the subsurface. The role of carbon with Mars, there's reduced carbon in the, that ALH 84001, but also somewhere on the planet Mars. There is a hint from uh, magnetometer measurements that at some point in time, Mars did have plate tectonics. Now, this has to be, you know, more research has to be done to verify that. We found where the water is, where the ice is, the structure of the crust is actually thicker than we thought. We, one of the big boons in uh, orbital science in the last two missions is, in fact, we see, I should be talking, we see 
minerals on the surface that have been in association with water. We can see broad areas of what was going on on the planet. And then one of the things that's kind of revealed itself as we thought more about it is that Mars, because it goes through times when it really tilts over on its axis and comes back, when it tilts way over, ice will form all over the planet. And then when it tilts back, that ice can get covered and we can have basically buried glaciers across the planet that are in, not in equilibrium, but because they're buried, they're, they're insulated, and they'll last well beyond their, you know, they should be. So we have sources of water in the mid-latitudes on Mars that shouldn't be there, but they're left over from the last time Mars tilted over on its axis. And what this does is it, pro it provides an opportunity for disequilibrium, which life could take advantage of. Looking for, speaking of looking for water, we found it in many different forms. Mars Odyssey found life, I mean, found water in the subsurface at the poles, lots of it. It really boosts our estimation of the inventory of water on the planet. It just happens to be in the form of ice. We've also measured it with the radar, and know the thickness of it. We've seen flow features on Mars. And this has been very intriguing and, and uh, helping us convince that early on Mars probably had a warmer and wetter climate. And in particular, if you look at this, it's a perfect picture of a delta. A delta is you have water flowing into standing water, similar to what happens in New Orleans. Uh, it's picture perfect. It really does encourage us that we had at least water stable enough on the surface that you could have a lake for a period of time. Mars Exploration Rovers, this one happens to be from Opportunity, it found uh, calcium sulfate, that's gypsum. This forms in water, this is stuck in a vein, so water was actually liquid, concentrated in calcium sulfate, and then as it evaporated, left that deposit. And then Curiosity just recently announced, now I guess it's about a month ago, finding these, this bedrock that kind of looked like Russian cement, it's a conglomerate, we find those on Earth in the bottom of riverbeds. So this is the best evidence to date of that we had flowing water on the surface of Mars. So let's talk about Curiosity. We've had a progression in rover capabilities. <coughs> Basically, the real purpose is to increase the proportion of instrumentation that we can take to the surface and what we're able to do with it. So basically, if we look at spirit and opportunity, their instrumentation only weighed about five to seven kilograms, depending upon what parts of it you want to count. Um, and, major, and the rover itself was like 175 kilograms. But if we look at Curiosity, 900 kilogram rover, but it's carrying close to 100 kilograms of instrumentation. So we've increased the percentage of what we can carry to the surface and certainly uh, vastly increased the capability. So let me go quickly through the instruments as they show up. Um, Dan, a dynamic, a dynamic albedo neutron, measures hydrogen, uh, measures nitrogen, measure neutrons, which are a, a proxy for hydrogen, and so it could tell you how much hydrogen, aka water, is in the you know first meter of the subsurface. REMS is a weather station. Mass Cam is a uh, binocular camera, s several different filter wheels, uh, highly capable, we'll see some pictures of that later. ChemCam is a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer. This is the first time we sent this type of instrument to another planet. It shoots a laser, plasmalizes whatever it's shooting, and when that plasma cools, it gives off wavelengths, uh, light in certain wavelengths, and the spectrometer can measure it. So it gives you elemental composition, and so if it was in this room, it could basically sample the whole room in terms of what things are made out of, including you. Uh, radiation detector, this is a high energy radiation detector, uh, broad spectrum, and what that does, it gives us a very good idea of how the radiation environment out in space, as it comes through the atmosphere, gets translated. So you, one of the issues may be <coughs> with health is that although galactic cosmic rays are dangerous, what they might generate as they come through the atmosphere actually might be more dangerous. 
or less, and that's good to know. And also, we suspect that there's a very important interaction with radiation on the surface of Mars and the photochemistry that may be going on on the surface. The far right is Molly. That's, a hand, that's the hand lens imager. It uh, can see down to about 14 microns. It has its own light source. It also has a UV light source. So sometime in the future, as we're playing around with it, we'll see if there's any fluorescence. But the real job is to look at mineral grains and rocks. APXS, alpha particle x-ray spectrometer, gives us elemental composition. This is a new and improved version of what's on um, Opportunity and Spirit, and also what was on Pathfinder, for that matter. MARTI is a descent imager. So basically, its primary function is already over. It was designed to just basically image as we got toward the surface. The highlight of this mission is that it's a roving analytical laboratory, and its laboratory are two instruments, Kemen and SAM. Kemen is an X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescent instrument. What it does is it gives you mineralogy. It tells you what the minerals are, what the spacing is in the atoms. SAM is a gas carbonograph, mass spectrometer, tunable laser system. Basically what this does is tells you what everything's made out of. So it's um, these two of giving you mineralogy and what they're made out of greatly complement each other and really vastly improves what we can get out of the rocks that we find on the surface of Mars to, to determine what the environment was when these rocks were made. So we took that rover, packaged it into this air shell, give you an idea of the size. Here's a real person who's about average. Um, I realized when I was going through the slides, I didn't have any pictures of the sky crane system because I assume that everybody has seen Seven Minutes of Terror. And, but I'll just remind you that besides packaging up, you have to unpack it. And uh, you have this weird Rube Goldberg device of having your rover hanging down from a bridle with the retro rockets up in space. We launched it November 26, picture perfect. This is the picture of the back of the cruise stage with solar panels on it. And on the way, we did science. RAD was turned on, radiation detector. And it was an interesting experiment. Well, one, it works. And uh, a, another satellite, ACES, was also measuring radiation in a similar environment. And so they both detected the same thing. But one of the nuances of this is kind of interesting is the radiation detector being inside the whole capsule would be seeing the same radiation as if you were an astronaut in a capsule, in the Orion capsule, going off somewhere. So this is a nice first measurement that gives us an idea of what the real radiation environment is for an astronaut as they're on their cruise to some other destination. So one of the really nice improvements in uh, our capabilities in exploring have been on the engineering side. And this one is the most graphic example. We did not send all these spacecraft here to Gale Crater, but I put the landing ellipses there to show you how we progressed from Viking, which landed in 76, its size of its landing ellipse, Pathfinder, approximately 150 kilometers in its longest diameter, Mars Exploration Rovers, a little bit smaller, down to about 100 kilometers, Phoenix is smaller than that, and then MSL, Curiosity, we have a landing ellipse at the most 20 kilometers in diameter in the long axes. The importance of this is there's no way we could have gone to Gale Crater, a place that has morphological evidence that water interacted with stuff, layering, so there's a history to, um, to reveal, and also mineralogical evidence of a place that's interacted with water. We could not have gone there with any other mission to this date until MSL because we needed that small landing ellipse to be able to place everything where we needed to go. Well, the good news is we landed successfully. We're still not quite up to 50%, but uh, doing pretty good. So let me uh, show you this. This is a... Um, a video of the descent imager. 
what was seen by the descent imager. So this is uh, what the imager saw during the process of unpacking the cruise stage and uh, dropping toward the surface of Mars. So that's the heat shield dropping away. And if you watch closely, you can actually see it hit the surface, similar to Wiley Coyote. And so this movement right now that you're seeing is actually the rover kind of the uh, back shell and everything, and the rover packed into it, swinging around underneath the parachute. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Uh, at the time, about 14 minutes. So this is actually on board. So if it, if it didn't work, we wouldn't have any images. So it, this was not streamed back during the telemetry. We're down to 86 meters per second at an altitude of 4 kilometers in descending. We've lost, we've lost tones from Earth at this time. This is expected. So they're uh, trying to get the uh, radar, getting a signal back from the radar to see, the, see how far away. 10.8 meters, vertical velocity. Get a ground and solution on it. So in a minute, you'll see the image jump, and that's basically the rover being dropped out of the back shell. Which, if you've ever seen a video, it scares the hell out of me every single time. So now, picture stabilizes. It's now under its own flight. About 70 meters per second. Signal to us, control air. Down to 50 meters per second. It's getting close. 500 meters now. Now it's going to start lowering the rover itself for underneath the uh, jet pack. Constant velocity, accordion nominal. Altitude error, 5.9 meters. We found a nice flat place. We're coming in ready for sky cramp. Some interaction of the, of the retro rockets with the surface, even though they're 20 feet away. The wheels just dropped down. Sky crane has started. Descending at about 0.75 meters per second, as expected. Expecting final cut shortly. Tingle to us, you remain strong. Tango Delta nominal. Yeah. Uh, you do so everybody now is like holding the rabbit's foot and biting their tongue, and but uh, actually you can see right here, it's uh, you can see the pebbles on the surface. I, I'm sure that wasn't me. I guess I'm, the um, if you uh, had a chance, go ahead and look at it. Um, online, the resolution is better. Um, but one of, the, one of the interesting things with this is, is that it now, looking at that, we're really worried about the rocket plume just causing all sorts of distortion that you wouldn't be able to see anything on the surface. And when we analyze it, there's several features that even during all the dust flying around and everything, you can still see those features. And so what that means is that you can do a terrain uh, recognition and hazard avoidance on the next mission if you care to spend the money to do it. But what it, it means it's possible. So that's really is a good harbinger for the next mission that we send to the surface in terms of ability to get to where we want to go. So here's a landing site. Picture taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter at a high rise. Uh, and that actually is the rover and uh, a little bit of bright spots next to it from the rocket plume. In fact, this whole area is, in fact, uh, affected by the, the retro rockets. Uh, with, with a little more analysis, we see all the pieces that were involved in getting through the uh, atmosphere and landing safely on the planet. Uh, and in fact, uh, High Rai was, was even able to take a picture of, of the back shell and the parachute as it was coming, descending through the atmosphere. So. In terms of capabilities, it's just fantastic. 
So this gives you an idea of like the final moments and you can even see scour spots from the retro rockets interacting with the surface of Mars. Um, oh yeah, uh, and we also, you know, we put we put the name on here just in case you go to Mars looking for one of the rovers, you want to pick up the right one. <laughs> this one's labeled, no mistake. Um, this is looking on the north rim of the crater. Uh, this is probably about 40 miles away. Gives you an idea of the capabilities of the camera. And looking to the south of us, that's Mount Sharp. This is the reason why we're going to Mar to Gale Crater. This mountain, doesn't look very big here, is um, five kilometers high. The reason why we picked it is because we can see layers, at least in the bottom third. And the layers have minerals associated with them. We have clays and we have sulfates. So we know that we have a record of the time when Mars went from being warmer and wetter, kind of neutral, to being a colder and drier and more acidic planet. So we're hoping as we explore Mount Sharp and go up there, we can actually sort through Mars as they went through this major transition of going from a more benign planet to the one it is today. Using the M100 camera on the mass cam, look over here kind of at the toe of Mount Sharp. This is, this is where we think the entrance is where we want to go. And this gives you an idea. You can see the layering. We can see that there's sediments there. We know that we land in the right spot because those layers are leaves of a book that will reveal the history of Mars and its uh, climate evolution. And, and just to give you an idea of how spectacular this camera is, that little dot right there is in fact the size of Curiosity. And so when we get there and start climbing up along the valleys here as we explore, it should be a pretty spectacular journey. So now let me uh, sh show you some baby pictures. This is uh, the mass cam plus the spectrometer lens of the LIBS instrument, the ChemCam. Uh, ChemCam works amazingly well with one shot. It feeds information to three different spectrometers of full broad wavelength from infrared to uh, ultraviolet. Uh, the picture on, the, on your right is the first rock that it zotted, uh, coronation. And it works spectacularly well and it's going to be a fantastic survey instrument. Um, here you can see one of the things that that lens does is that you can use it as an imager and so you can see exactly where you, you shot the rock. And so you can see five shots over on the right hand side. And the, per, import, the importance of this is rocks are heterogeneous. When you hit one small spot you have to know whether or not you hit a feldspar or another crystal. So you get an idea of what exactly you, you shot when you get the LML composition. You know, one of the things that this is a, a pretty neat way to explore. The public has a slightly different view of how <laughs> we're, you know, doing this, but. So this, this is a self-portrait of uh, Curiosity in uh, an area called Rock Nest. This is where we spent uh, approximately a month and a half digging in the dirt and measuring rocks in the area. And you can see right here, uh, five scoops of uh, where it's been digging the, up the, the sand and dust, running it through the system primarily you know, to clean out the systems. You know, any earth organics that we might have brought with us, we're kind of rinsing out the whole sampling system with Mars dirt to, to reduce you know, any potential contamination. Uh, and that's worked fairly well and this is the first time we've taken solid samples and fed it into the analytical laboratory. Uh, just as a note, in terms of contact instruments, that's the arm. Out on the arm, we have two instruments, APXS and MOLLE, and then also a drill. And so here, on the, on the left is MOLLE with its lights on. You can see two white lights right there. Um, the UV lights are also on, and if you flip back and forth from them on and not on, you can start to see a blue haze from the UV lights. And then over on the right hand side is uh, alpha particle x-ray spectrometer. So here, 
Molly works extremely well. It does some Z stacking. It has infinite focus. And so one of the nice things it can do is go through, take a whole series of pictures, and then you can pick which one you really want and they'll all be in focus. Uh, here's a spectra of APXS. Uh, the important thing of this is, is that we're seeing NML composition. The instrument's working. And you know this is a basalt, kind of what we expected, but you know this is we're just starting things. We're kind of getting a background of information on the Mars, and it's just nice to see the confirmation of what we expected. We have a weather station. I think one of the things that really amazes me is the range of temperatures that you suffer every single day on the surface of Mars. We're seeing almost 100 degrees in Fahrenheit variation. This does have some very practical effects, such as the arm will grow and shrink by one centimeter just because of the temperature change. Not a good thing if you're in the middle of drilling and having that kind of movement. Um, one of the things that really surprised me, I didn't quite realize it, is that you have pressure changes every single day on the order of 10%. It's huge. If, if, if this was you, if you were there, you'd be popping your ears every two, two hours. Um, it turns out that this is all thermally derived. The atmosphere is so thin, the surface facing the sun heats up tremendously and causes a huge circulation and actually a big pressure wave that just basically moves around the planet as it follows the heating of the surface, causing a 10% variation in the pressure. Amazing. Um, I just want to show you here one of the things that came up recently is um, Marcy, the camera on uh, MRO, spotted a dust storm brewing. Pretty good size. These white arrows mark it out. Um, of concern to curiosity because it affects you know, imagery and that sort of thing that you're taking. You might want to buckle down with your cameras, close the hand lens, dust cover. But it's a bigger problem for opportunity since it's solar, pan, uh, solar powered. It turns out that that dissipated, and so one of the nice things to do, we have a weather station on Mars, we have orbital information. It is be really good to get an understanding of why some of these pretty large dust storms show up and then disappear. Well, sometimes they'll show up and then go global, which has happened in the past. Okay, Dan is showing you your thermal and epithermal neutrons. The variation between the thermal and epithermal neutrons tells you whether or not there's water in the subsurface. That's working very well, and it's doing a survey. So as it moves along, it gives us an idea. They've seen as much as a two-fold variation in hydrogen content. So this is kind of the overall near-term plan. We landed in Bradbury Landing. We have this hummocky unit that we've been exploring. Over here, we see this crater terrain, which is very typical of much of Mars. So it, for some reason, it's more consolidated. The impacts on it last longer. They're there. That's what gives Mars the old look to it, particularly in the highlands. And then the third terrain, what we call the fractured unit, seems to be an extension of whatever cause the alluvial fan coming into Gale Crater, and this seems to be the lowest part of it. And so we've been headed to an area called Glen Elg uh, with the expectation, because we're going the wrong direction in terms of getting the mountain sharp, that we'll just go back in the same direction when we head out, and Glen Elg will look the same coming and going, being a palindrome. So here's where we landed, right here. We had pegged this area to having an alluvial flan, uh, fan, but we had no mineralogy that clued us into what it really was because it's covered with dust. But it did have a high thermal inertia. So we knew there, we suspected that there was consolidated rocks underneath that dust. And we weren't sure what it was. When we landed, this is one of the scours right next to the rover. We went another uh, 30 meters or so. We found another outcrop that look just like this. This is bedrock. You see these round pebbles. You see the matrix itself, the stuck together. And then also a third place, about 100 meters away from original landing site, we see more of this what looks like uh, Roman concrete. We landed on a riverbed. 
a river that is, you know, ankle to waist deep, fairly rapid flow. We're in the right place. That water had to go somewhere. We're thinking that the Glen Elg area is the lowest lying area near there, so maybe the water pooled there. So we're heading in that direction. So let me talk a little bit more about the other instruments. SAM. SAM in and of itself is pretty complicated. It has like 54 valves, 52 heaters. It's amazing it works at all. Um, and we've done some atmospheric measurements. Um, these are not real surprises, although the amount of nitrogen was a little bit more than we expected. But you see that argon and uh, nitrogen, the two, second two major constituents. Uh, what will be interesting as we sort through isotopes, figuring out what has happened to the atmosphere through time, the isotopes will give us a clue. So the meteorite that clued us in to the fact that we had Martian meteorites was EETA, which stands for Elephant Hills, um, 79001. It had glass inclusions. They were able to measure the gas trapped by that glass, and that pegged them to Mars. And now we have some measurements. These match up great with those. It proves that those are Martian meteorites. But also, what this does is portend some great results that we're going to have in the future as we're looking at the different isotopes that tell us the processes that cause Mars to lose so much of its atmosphere. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we spent a good portion of time at Rock Nest. Here's a, a picture of the arm getting a scoop. And this is results from Kemen. This is the X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescent. What happens is the X-rays go through the sample. They get bent by how the atoms are arranged with each other. And then basically, the brightness and distancing of this tells you exactly what kind of minerals are there. Very effective. 10 minutes later, you have a result that is fantastic. To give you an idea of what went into doing this, this is what an XRD, XRF looks like in the lab. They've had to package it down to fit on SAM, and now there's a commercial version that fits in a briefcase. So you can take it out in the field and do mineralogy right there, which is fantastic. It's also been adapted to, um, by the Carnegie to look at minerals in paints and that sort of thing. And this is Giacomo Chari, who's the head of curation at um, Carnegie. And uh, so that's kind of cool that it's being used in that way also. We also have results from SAM. Essentially what happened, this is uh, what's called evolved gas analysis. You take your sample, you heat it up, and the more heat you put into it, it starts breaking down, it gives off gases, it gives off oxygen, uh, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, um, and there's approximately they, like 200 channels or so. So this is just the plot of some of the channels that give you more information of basically the molecular weight of oxygen, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and sulfate. So that works. Uh, it can uh, really tell you what the rocks are made out of. One of the interesting things is, is that they found chlorine compounds coming off at very specific points. And so what this does is point to um, potentially perchlorate. This is something that was found by Phoenix in the polar layer, ter layer terrain. Uh, there was no expectation or you know, agnostic about whether or not perchlorate was only in polar areas or whether or not it would be global. And here we are near the equator and we're finding some perchlorate. And this is, has significant effects on looking at comp organic compounds, and it looks to us like the traces of organic compounds that we're finding that Sam is measuring are actually products of the perchlorate breaking down and interacting with, uh, with other carbon in the system, you know, such as carbon dioxide and that sort of thing. So, although looking confusing, uh, it points to that the instrument is working fantastically, and that even traces of carbon are being picked up by the perchlorate and it just, it kind of spells good news. We did not expect 
on measuring sand to actually find organic matter because it's probably the worst environment on the planet to expect anything organic to survive just because of the high radiation environment, all the things are going on. There's a listing of why you wouldn't expect organics to be found in sand. So one other aspect of this mission that I particularly enjoy and I'm proud of NASA for getting this out to the public is that the public outreach part of it I think has been extremely successful. Um, it is one of those things, all the, all the metrics we have for tracking public interest and accessing web pages and that sort of thing are off the charts as far as curiosity has gone. And I think this is great. It gets the next generation really interested in science and te technology. So we landed over here. We're headed in this direction. We're actually near the edge of what we're calling uh, Yellowknife Bay. Here's an image of it. We actually are just finished parking here, doing a 360 panorama, basically getting a, a very good feel of the area and, and picking what is going to be the first rock that, that we're going to drill and feed those in the analytical lab. And one of the real interesting parts is seeing this layering stuff, these flat plates that we're calling shaler, uh, looks extremely interesting and we're trying to figure out if there's a reasonable way to uh, drill that material and get samples into our an analytical lab. And so we're going to be doing that for the next month or so depending upon how interesting it is. And then after that, we're, then we're going to head off to the base of uh, Mount Sharp and head toward here for the, for the rest of the expedition which will be happening in, in less than a year. And with that, I'd, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Oh. Was Mount Sharp uh, formed on, by the impact which uh, created the crater? And why would it have layers uh, if it's an impact? Yeah. Crater? So, so excellent question because um, most craters that you see a central peak in, the peak is, is formed by the rebound of the impact. This is not the case. Um, it is a little bit of a mystery how you got a mound that size in the crater. So one of the clues that it's not a rebound mound is that Mount Sharp is actually higher than the rim of the crater. Um, the, let's say the, the favorite running theory is the crater was formed, it was completely buried, and then Later on, it was exhumed, except for the central mound stayed there. So it's kind of exhumed in a washing machine kind of mode where wind scoured out the moat around the mountain. And so what we're seeing, the layering in Mount Sharp, is in fact layering left over that was crater-wide. Seems fantastic, but we're dealing with, you know, three billion years of history. Uh, it's not too unusual. I mean, the Grand Canyon is uh, about 1.8 miles deep. And that has two billion years of history of the American continent. So we're hoping that Mount Sharp with its layering will have a similar record. So my question is about the uh, 2020 rover that you're sending up. Yeah. Um, so you said that you have a, so to speak, a geochemist and a geologist on Mars. What's the plan for that rover? What's going to be its main goal? If I remember right, it has a really, really long mission time compared to the previous ones. Um, how long is that? Yeah, the uh, Mars Exploration Rovers had a 90-day design lifetime. And, you know, one lasted seven and a half years, and the opportunity is still going, and it's uh, about to hit nine years in January. Um, Curiosity has a two-year uh, design lifetime, one Mars year, actually. <coughs> so... Um, the expectation is uh, 24 times two years is quite a long time for that <laughs> rover to be running. Um, the, we think that the 2020 rover will have a similar um, lifetime, but we, we have to weigh the potential of using solar panels versus uh, radioisotope thermal electric generators. And um, so that 
has a, uh, a real, is a big variable in terms of what the expected lifetime would be. Because solar panels will dust up, wear out, and at some point in time you get lucky where you, unlucky where you don't have enough energy to continue. We are forming a science definition team to, to tell us what the real, um, the actual objectives of the mission will be, but it's certainly along the lines of not only looking for a place that could have supported life, but also looking for evidence that, of what may have been there, what may preserve evidence of life. So um, we fully expect that it should have some organic uh, capability. Yeah. I was a particle physicist before I joined Google, so I'm interested in the, in the radiation levels. We've seen like two or three spikes on the way to Mars, and do we know the reason? And uh, what is the uh, average and the spike radiation level on the surface of Mars? Um, uh, yeah, so I don't know the numbers in terms of sieverts and that sort of thing. <coughs> the cause of the spikes are basically um, uh, solar particle events. Uh, whether or not the coronal mass ejections or um, SEPs, whatever. So if you uh, compare the radiation with the level of radiation in, on, on Earth, what's the kind Yeah, of so um, it, essentially, you know, kind of a rule of thumb, and, and you know, the, the important part is in the details, but the rule of thumb is, is that compare in open space, it's about twice what you see on space station because space station is protected from, uh, by the Van Allen belt. It turns out that on the surface of Mars is about half of what you see in space. So it's, it, it's similar to what you may see in space station. And the reason for that is, is just that you have a planet on one side of you shielding you from half the cl uh, galactic cosmic rays. It's a, it's a very simple thing. The atmosphere doesn't seem to do much for you. Although, um, I didn't show it, but we've seen a correlation between the pressure wave that comes across and actually the amount of radiation hitting the surface. So there is some effect, and it's measurable, but it's not, it's a minor effect. So um, there was some concern about contamination of the drill bit because it got remounted. Um, I, I read an article about that. I, uh, <coughs> so how, how does that affect the, the announcement on Monday? Okay, so um, the drill bit contamination was uh, a little bit of an issue because they, uh, when they made it, they quenched it in oil, which is not a real good idea if you're going to measure organics. Um, so they went through a real process to clean that up, and um, so we think that whatever contamination there is left is pretty minor. Uh, there's also con some concern about um, the Teflon bushings that hold the drill bit during progressive uh, uh, percussive drilling, and but they can characterize that. It's not a problem. The announcement of what information we got from Sam has nothing to do with the drill bit because we haven't used the drill yet. So all of that is um, from the scoop itself, and uh, so that's why that's part of the reason why the amount of carbon that ends up being reacting with the perchlorate and showing up in the gas chromatograph is, we think, is carbon actually coming from something else like carbonate coming off or any other carbon in the system, but not low molecular weight carbon that may actually be in, in the soil or as a contaminant. So we don't think it's coming from um, Earth itself, except for maybe some of the uh, slight derivatization product that we're carrying with us. So, yeah, the drill is um, something to come, and, and we're, we hope to start doing that before the Christmas holidays. Um, first, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, this, is just, this just totally delights me. Um, what was the inspiration and motivation for the audacious skyhook? And just for my morbid curiosity, what was the escape strategy once the um, curiosity had touched down? Um, so, I mean, interestingly enough, there's, there are components to this whole system that have been used before. So, for instance, the bridle and the idea of lowering your payload down beneath retro rockets, they actually did that on the Mars Exploration Rovers, where they had retro rockets attached to the, you know, underneath the parachute, and they lowered 
the airbag system before they actually inflated the airbags and dropped it. So it, interestingly enough, they had a bridal concept that they'd already tested on Mars. So it wasn't totally insane to go, go that pathway. It turns out what was the driving factor is every single time they came up with a design where the spacecraft would land with the rockets underneath them, they ended up with a huge problem with rocket plume interaction with the surface. It gets extremely unstable, and any slight variations cause a major perturbation in exactly how to end. And the way it has been handled in the past is you actually turn off the rockets before you touch down, which has its own risk. So because of that, you, then you need two things. You need, you need legs to land on, because you need some kind of you know, shock system. And then also, once you land, you have to get your rover from the platform down to the surface. So now you need ramps and that sort of thing. And they kept on running into just this being on the surface and getting the rover down was going to add you know, several hundred kilograms in terms of mass. And, um, and somebody came up with, hey, you know, well, if we just lower the rover and have it land on the wheels, we don't have to add legs, and we don't have to add a ramp. And so that was uh, the real motivator in saving, saving several hundred kilograms in terms of what the landed payload is that you could put on the surface. Um, the exit strategy for the retro rockets was, um, as the system comes down, um, it knows how much thrust it's using to keep a steady descent toward the ground. At some point in time, when the rover touches the surface, all of a sudden your motion sensor and the amount of thrust that you're using, you go, hey, I weigh half as much as I used to a second ago. And so as soon as that's recognized, the bridle's cut, the re retro rockets keep on, they go full throttle, and it just flies off. And the only uh, real control of it after that time is, in fact, just fly away. There's, um, all the brains are on the rover. Well, the curiosity, um, yeah. Um, so, one of the great things about having uh, the Mars Exploration rovers last for an extended period of time is that you got to upgrade the software, you got to do more experiments in terms of mobility. And so, one of the things that's instituted on this mission that is, is kind of interesting is what's called visual odometry. So, the system itself can look around and recognize its environment and go, well, I must have traveled 10 meters. And, and so that's a, an improvement in terms of knowing exactly how far it went and that sort of thing. They've also instituted a little more cautious approach to understanding wheel slip. And, uh, and that was actually one of the real problems that got Spirit into trouble was it, when it didn't go anywhere and kept on trying to go somewhere, it really dug itself into the, into the small crater that it was in. Down in the middle. Hi, uh, how does the recent news of the uh, water ice on Mercury affect the future of Mars missions? Um, actually, in a weird way, I think it might add a little greater understanding in terms of the subtleties of exploring another planet and what does it really tell you. It wasn't the water on Mercury that, well, that's a big surprise, and that's really interesting, but also the announcement that there's or organics associated with the ice that is particularly interesting. And what that does is help highlight the fact that one of the big mysteries on Mars is not, is that we didn't find organics yet really on the surface, because there should be organics just from raining down from space, from uh, chondritic chondrites and that sort of thing. So there, the, what that does is highlights that there should be organics on the surface of Mars, and our thought is if it weren't for such a high radiation environment on the surface. Uh, the, the ice on Mercury is shadowed by uh, a crater, and, uh, and the organics themselves are shadowed by a crater too, so there's 
that's why they're still there and haven't been kind of uh, vaporized away. So in the roadmap that you showed, you said the robotic missions until 2020. How does it affect potential human exploration, maybe with Google Glasses or future technologies in terms of landing sites or whatnot? Yeah, interesting. One of the things that we'd like to do as an agency uh, is um, better coordinate our future exploration and uh, having the science and human exploration uh, work cooperatively toward, hopefully, for Mars, actually. And uh, so the, the president had suggested that we be, well, say that we should be getting to Mars in the 2030s. And uh, I think by exploring the planet this way robotically, as we set things up and do some measurements that help reduce the risk for humans to go, that as we go further along that line, I think we'll improve the capabilities and potential for humans to go to Mars. The radiation experiment is a great example of we are doing something that will, will be extremely useful for human exploration when they go to the red planet. I think I answered your question. Can uh, Curiosity's robot arm function on Earth, or is it designed specifically for a low gravity arm? So Curiosity's arm, can it function on Earth? Um, yeah, I, I think it can, um, but, be, but in a low gravity environment and also the wide temperature regime that we see on Mars, you can test things out here on Earth, but you're not going to know exactly how it behaves until you get there and then do um, some test outs and waypoints and mark how everything is operating. You might have noticed on some of the images, there are some targets that look kind of like, um, you know, nuclear regulation, uh, regulatory commission symbols, and what those are are actually targets, so that when you move the arm around, you can, you can find out where exactly it goes with the set commands, and you can then get more used to how the arm behaves and and improve the efficiency of when you're doing sampling and that sort of thing. I suspect they couldn't actually move the arm full length with the full instrumentation on the end of it on Earth, in Earth gravity. Yeah. In general, not so much related to uh, NASA. What do you think about the Mars One project that plans to send humans to Mars, but like sometimes around 2024? Great. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, this is one of these things where. Uh, a government agency by its very nature has to be conservative and what we can do in the commercial sector is great and you know I they have a very interesting and, and uh, clever engineers and I I think they have a reasonable shot I mean do you think it's realistic and what about the fact that it's a one-way trip for humans to Mars um, well, you know, there's, there's a list of people I'd want to send on that trip. <laughs> but, you know, and interestingly enough, I know a fair number of people who'd be, would, who would volunteer for that. So um, the, um, NASA is not in the, the business of creating heroes uh, and so would never consider a mission that was only one way. But in the commercial sector, you can do that. And uh, it certainly makes it a lot easier. <laughs> Except for the person that goes. <laughs> but, uh, yes, uh, Could you walk us through uh, like a typical day in the life of a rover, how many experiments you can run in any given day, how far you can travel? Oh, actually that's, a, that's one of the uh, real learning experiences of being on the mission is how painfully slow everything is. Um, so one, I think everybody here realizes that you can't joystick the rover. You can't drive it like this. Um, you have a time variance any, anywhere from 8 to 40 minutes, depending upon where Earth and Mars are in reference to each other. So the way a, a day works is a orbiter pass goes by in the morning, quotes in the morning, 
And when we get that data back is when the day starts. So we now have a data dump of what the rover did the previous day. Um, the team meets, they look at the, the data, see what happened. Did the rover do what it was supposed to do? Did the measurements work? Was there something exciting that the rover just discovered? Well, the rover didn't discover it, but you know, data that it took that got everybody excited. So then the rest of the time in, in basically morning and mid-afternoon is, okay, let's say it, the rover did what it's supposed to do, so now you build your sequences, what sequence of me measurements you want to do, do you want the rover to rove, do you need to bump up against a rock and take a measurement there, you plan out what is going to happen. Sequences get built and basically by late day, evening, they get sent to Mars and then they get downloaded on the rover and the rover by now is ready to start a new day and it gets its instructions to what to do. Um, what you can do in any one saw um, increases with time as you get more comfortable with how many things can you do at the same time without breaking something. Uh, initially, whenever we did one, in, we did an instrument for the first time. Essentially, we would just do that instrument, make it, you know, make it easy, reduce the number of factors that could have caused it to, you know, to uh, reset or that sort of thing. Um, but we've gotten to the point now where, for instance, the weather and the rad instrument and the uh, Dan instrument now run as kind of background routine. So there's not a there might be some commanding because you want something special from them, but in general, they're done every day. It's a routine measurement. You can go onto a web page and, and get the Mars weather for the day type of thing. So we've, we've adjusted to that. Um, running, for instance, SAM, which is probably the most complicated instrument, uh, that actually has to run overnight. And uh, so we, if you're going to do a SAM experiment that, you know, that saw, that's the only thing you're going to do, uh, not only because of the length of time it takes to run, but the other part is it uses up a fair amount of energy. You have to heat up your piping and that sort of thing, heat up the sample because you're doing a ball gas analysis. So essentially, if you're doing that, you don't have enough energy to do much else other than to beam back the data, that sort of thing. ChemCam is now gotten comfortable enough that it can shoot several targets in a day as opposed to just one. Uh, the mass cam is, uh, it, it actually has a very interesting feature. It has so much memory that we've figured out the best way to use it is when you get someplace new or a different perspective, go ahead and shoot an entire panorama, keep everything on board, send back thumbnails of the images that you took, and then when you go through the thumbnails, you go, oh, th that's really interesting. Let's look at that. Then you ask the spacecraft to send back the full resolution image. So there, in general, we are able to do now probably you know, a couple of instruments at the same time, except for maybe the ones that you use a fair amount of energy. Just to get it, put it in perspective, the RTG is producing about 110 watts. So that's each, you know, that's the amount of uh, power you have in you know, each hour type of thing. And uh, so you have to manage it so that you don't reduce the battery power by more than 40 percent. Uh, let's I'm please, gonna, we'll, we'll continue uh, after. So let's thank now Michael and uh, we can gather around. Thank you very much.